Dr. Katharina Howards. You know, she has a PhD in jurisprudence. That's quite amazing. And plus, she's into all this art and a few other things. Um, yesterday, we had an event, and a fellow named Jan van der Lee was the presenter. And he is only the vice president of innovation of a laboratory owned by a company that has sales of $70 billion, a French company called Electricity of France. It's the largest provider of energy in France. It also provides a lot of energy for England and several other places. I found two things that he said extremely important, interesting. He said he heard what the father of Stanford's new energy system was developing. This is the father, Joe Stegna. And when he heard what Joe was developing, he became extremely interested. And he thought it was significant. So this vice president of innovation located in Los, Al Los, Los Altos got on the phone and called the chief operating officer of Electricity of France, the company he works for. And he said, guess what I discovered? And the CEO says, I'm going to get the ambassador from France, of France to the United States. We want to see this thing ourselves. So I took that as another indication that what Joe Stagner has developed at Stanford as being of great importance. And then he said something else that I thought you know, really pertains to, to me. And he, uh, he, I think he thinks Michael Killen discovered what Joe has done and that I thought it was important to go and symbolically interpret what Joe did. And then he says, well, Michael, uh, let's set up a meeting with the ambassador from France to the United States, and let's talk to him about you making a painting to help France, and that would influence our behavior in the United States and maybe other places. So I'm, he's definitely going to set up the meeting. And, and I will be very uh, happy to happen. So this is Joe Stagner. He is the executive at Stanford that I think talked the university into spending almost a half a billion dollars to replace this old system that was sprewing out a tremendous amount of gases, greenhouse gases, and wasting a tremendous amount of water and money, et cetera. And whatever this is right here is the system Joe put together. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Joe Stegner. Thanks. Where did my water thank go? You. Well, I got to thank Michael for uh, the opportunity to be here and for the first great painting he gave me. And Hopefully, we'll wrestle this away from the display at Stanford uh, somewhere, too. I really love the colors. Uh, but I agree entirely that, that art is uh, optimism and hope. And that was my quote about Michael, was that uh, it's the hope of going from what was to what is. I've seen that in both of the paintings he, he gave. And that's very important that, that art is that, but it inspires people, too. Because you know one of the big challenges with global warming was the willpower. You know We have the technology to get out of this hole we've dug ourselves into, and everybody's long lamented, it's the willpower of enough people to do it. We're about 50-50 in America right now, right? So anything people can do to help inspire that and show that there can be a better path. Uh, art, economics works good too. You know, Art inspires economics, allows some folks to do stuff. And I think they're discovering all over the place that we can move to cleaner systems and actually save money in many cases, and at least not spend any more in many other cases. 
So it's great that you know a lot of people are understanding that and people are interested in that and interested in learning and seeing the proof of that, which goes to our plant. So it's a great system, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But it's also was designed uh, to be a very outward focusing system, a kind of piece of industrial art uh, for those of you that may have seen it. It's very colorful. There's glass everywhere so you can see. There's signage to tell you how it works. The pipes are colored to show how it works. And it's really great that it's outward facing and it invites people to come and see it, unlike the old cogen plant, which had a giant wall and barbed wire <laughs> saying, dirty, oily, smoky, unsafe, stay out, you know, dangerous place. This one says, clean, calm, quiet, beautiful, come on in. So it's a form of industrial art, and it really plays into Stanford's mission to help you know, show people this, to invite them to see it and feel safe about it and see what can be done. So that was a really great thing Stanford did to take the great engineering we did, but then put a great piece of artist, uh, artistic wrap around it to make people uh, come and enjoy it. And we have had plenty of visitors, like Michael says, the French Connection is really great. Gene Hackman hasn't seen the plant, <laughs> but, but we have had the ambassador from France. We had the CEO of the world's largest energy company, Electricity to France. We had their COO, their full board cabinet, and many of their subdivisions. We've had several French universities. So France has a, a lot of you know, non-polluting electricity. And so it makes sense that they're trying to figure out how to electrify everything in their country to take advantage of that to reduce the greenhouse gases. California is moving to clean electricity, and so now the state's also looking at, well, how do we get buildings to use that? Some of you may know, you know, the state passed rules saying by 2045, we want a carbon-free electricity grid. Well, just in the last week or two, the Energy Commission and Public Utilities Commission have started rulemaking to say, well, that's great, but that's only half the battle. We now have to get rid of all the things in buildings that burn gas and have them use electricity instead to take advantage of that clean grid. So our system was a big example of that. It is, and it's, it's a working example that people in the world can come see that at this scale, it can be done. And there's many other examples all the way from the residents on up to show how it can be done. And the secret is all through uh, heat pumps, uh, just taking anything that uses gas and replacing it with electric heat pumps for heating and hot water. Um, we now, with the signing of a recent contract for another 25 years of solar, and this is a little controversial to some, but <clears throat> we've gone 100% uh, solar power for all of our electricity. Even though we don't use power at the, the nighttime, we've bought enough solar plant power to be built for the next 25 years to equal our total electricity use. And since we're displacing natural gas use in the daytime, it's almost the same as if we stored it in a battery and used it at night and stopped burning gas in a power plant at night. There's a lot more room for renewables in California's mix, and there's a room for nuclear and a room for storage. How the state figures out how to make this grid clean, we're fine with any of it, but you've got to electrify your buildings and get a clean grid, and then we're all there. And it's easier than you think. Back when we first started conceiving of new energy systems for Stanford was in 2008 when I joined, and the campus said, look, we want to get more sustainable. We're already doing a lot, but how do we move to true sustainability? And the first thing was to look at the energy system, the gas cogeneration plant. And it was fortunate for Stanford because we knew that that plant was going to expire in March of 2015. It was a 1980s vintage plant, and the contract for its operation was due to expire March 1st of 2015. So we knew we had a seven-year lead time to see if there was something better than just continuing on with that, you know, adding on to it, things like that. And that study led to this system. And it was kind of funny to me that it seemed very complicated at the time, the things we were looking at. And people would say, could this work? Is this possible? And now, fast forward eight years later, it seems so simple and obvious, honestly. It does, it, it seems inevitable that buildings will all go to a system like this where you use clean electricity and whenever you're air conditioning, you use the waste heat from it to make the hot water from your house instead of throwing it away out the side of your house. And in winter, you use a heat pump to suck heat from the air or the ground to keep your house warm and it's all powered by clean electricity and you don't have any pollution. Um, we used to think there were all kinds of approaches. You know, it was, there's going to be many arrows in the quiver of a sustainable energy system. You're going to have a mismatch of all kinds of things. 
It might be tidal power under the Golden Gate Bridge, a windmill in San Mateo, uh, you know, who knows what. But it all comes down to this simple clean electricity and using everything electric. And it's almost like cars. I like to think of our energy system as the Tesla of energy plants because the parallels to electric vehicles are so similar. We used to have a big gas cogeneration plant. It's like a jet turbine, like on a wing of an aircraft, and you put natural gas in it, and it turns very fast, and a bunch of hot exhaust comes out the end, and that hot exhaust makes steam, and that steam is sent to buildings to make them warm and make hot water, and some of the steam drives a turbine to make electricity, and the main unit also drives a generator to make electricity. But there's very many moving parts. Just like if you look under the hood of your car, you watch one of those car rehabilitation shows like dealer, Wheeler Dealers, so many parts, so many oily bits as they call them, and so many complex systems to make this work. And humanity's done great perfecting internal combustion engines. So much technology's been developed in 100 years, and there'll probably be more. But you can replace it all with a battery and electric motor, a very simple system that runs very clean and quiet. Any of you that have those electric cars, you know the difference. Well, that's what we did. All those oily bits we used to have in that complex cogen plant with all the steam huffing and puffing and things moving. Basically, our new plant's just electric motors. Those big machines you see, they're electric-driven motors that move fluids around. They compress refrigerants and they expand in the you know, thermal cycle. And we have pumps that move the stuff around. So it's very much like we went from a gas car to an electric car, the similar, uh, similar path. And so um, we have had the privilege of getting the thing done, showing that it works. I remember uh, Vice President Bob Reedy you know, thought, thought we were nuts when I first got there to want to tear down this cogen plant. Um, but then it all made sense. We did all our peer reviews, and everybody said this makes sense. And, and the board said, OK, we'll give you $500 million to do this, because it makes sense. It's the best thing for the next 30 years for Stanford. And halfway through the construction project, you can see the, the worried look over my vice president is returning the thing. He goes, man, I sure hope this works. <laughs> I sure hope this works. We're going to be in real trouble if it doesn't work. Uh, but I assured him it would. And we had all the detailed planning, engineering views. I was 100% confident. But it, it's fun to see a little panic like that when you're in the middle of you know, a moonshot like that to see it work, but it works, and it's now been working fine for four years. And that's the other proof. You know, the federal government and a lot of others test new energy plant concepts by prove it works for three years. Then we'll start considering it as a technology that works. We'll start allowing you to apply for awards and stuff like that. And so it's been working for four years just great. And uh, it's lived up to its promises economically and exceeded them in terms of sustainability. Uh, one of the big things was when we got approval for that plant, we were a PG&E customer. And all the pg and is a green utility getting greener. Um, by getting direct access uh, in the state, which is a way you can buy your own electricity, it's almost like the community choice aggregation that happened all through thing. A similar form of that we got a few years ago. Now we can go out and make our electricity 100% green, which made it even better. And it also made it cheaper, about 20% cheaper from pg and the way we went out and purchased our electricity. So we got greener and we got cheaper, and it only added to the big benefits of the system. Uh, but what the system is, for those of you who haven't had a tour, and by the way, we give tours every Thursday. You can sign up for them online if anybody would like to see the system. We give, we've probably had uh, you know, 500 tours in five years and over 10,000 people from all around the world. Just today, two tours of a big real estate developer called Related Development in, in Santa Clara. They're building a very big development near Levi's Stadium, I understand. They developed the Hudson Yards uh, development in Manhattan, which was huge, one of the biggest projects New York's ever seen. And um, so you know, they've heard about the system, and they want to see if they could use it for this complex. Same with uh, Google Sidewalk Labs and the Toronto Waterfront development. Um, we've had. Uh, Today, Foothill College come in. So they heard about the system, and they would like to be the first community college to deploy it and show the other 118 community colleges in, uh, in California that it can be done. It can be done at this scale, and here's how it looks at this scale, different, smaller scale. And so we're just eager as heck to, to work with them and, and hope they can do it. And it sounds like they're pretty serious about doing it. Um, when we went to build a new real estate development, Stanford Redwood City, uh, six big buildings, a million and a half square feet. We looked 
uh, very hard economically. Should we have a system like we have at the main campus there? Does it really make sense at other scales? And since that was led primarily by our real estate division, which operates under different principles than main campus, main campus is about history and preservation and long-term quality. And there's some questions, is this more of a real estate development? Should we build it, quote, on the cheap? You know, not totally cheap, but you know, a lot cheaper than you build uh, a heritage building on the main campus. And so they were very interested in cost and economics. But an independent consultant that they hired looked at all the different kinds of energy systems, the standalone building systems like real estate developers normally put in, and concluded that a system like at main campus is actually the cheapest, best thing for Redwood City too. Totally different application. And so that's why we have what we call mini SESI there. And I mentioned to others, if you drive on 101 and you see the Stanford Medical Center white glass building, you're going to see a nice silver tank next to it. That's the thermal storage tank for that system, much like the big ones we have on our campus. And so that's another proof of how to design and build it on a different scale, different application. And we're hoping that others like you know, real estate development or a, a community college will do it and provide you know, a living lab for, for others to see it. So um, everything's good. Our greenhouse gas is now at 68%, reduced from when we had the cogen plant. When the new solar plant comes online, we'll be over 80%. And uh, we have a few other things to do, uh, a new innovative system we call lake water heat exchange. So some of you may know we have something called felt reservoir up in the hills. And so we're gonna, we have pipes connecting that reservoir to campus, and we're going to set up a recirculation system where we can pump heat out of that lake in winter uh, to augment the heat we get from campus and so we can stop burning natural gas 100% for our system. We have 8% of our wintertime heat is made by burning gas because we don't have enough waste heat now. So we'll be able to pump heat out of that lake, get it naturally with clean electricity, driving the whole thing, and avoid that. Likewise, in summer, uh, we can save a bunch of drinking water. So you know how precious high quality water is, you know, the Hetch Hetchy system and all the things we have to uh, get good, fresh, clean water for the Bay Area. Well, Stanford has a limit on how much of that we can use, and that greatly affects our, our ability to function and grow and be sustainable. And so we've done so much work over the years to reduce our use of that. We cut it, our limit's like 3 million gallons a day, and we reduced it from the late 90s down to about 2.2 million gallons a day through all kinds of conservation and things. And when the, we looked at our energy system, the campus didn't really know or wasn't aware that 25%, one-fourth of our drinking water was being consumed in that old fossil fuel power plant. And most of it was in evaporative cooling towers to get rid of waste heat while we were burning fossil fuel to make heat to send right back out after we were throwing heat away. So by doing this system, we're eliminating that too, and we've already returned 18% of our water supply back to the university to support academic and residents and so forth. And we should be able to get another 5% or so when we complete the job. So heat recovery and electrification also can save a lot of water. And that's an interesting energy water nexus that I don't think we knew about in the state. When you, know, you used to hear about the old energy water nexus in the state, it's that we have all these hydroelectric projects and need for water in the state, the Central Valley Project and these kind of things. And so there's both a lot of electricity generated from our hydroelectric dams that serve as flood protection, water supply, and so forth. But yet, then it takes a lot of water energy to pump water around the state. So how can we make this energy water nexus work better? Well, there's another energy water nexus, and it's heat recovery and electrification. I'd ask you, when you drive around, look for plumes of condensate. It looks like smoke going up, especially over in Benicia, anywhere else you see. If it's cold outside and you see a plume of water, that means somebody is wasting both water and heat when it's cold. And you see it all over the place. And if you recover that heat and use it to heat a nearby house or a business, you also save the water. And so I'd like to see the state quantify that. I'd add up all the cooling towers in the state and see how much water and heat we're wasting and see that as a, as a high level strategy for the Energy Commission and others. But they haven't tallied that up yet. Hopefully we and others can influence them to start looking at these new you know, scalable strategies for the state as a whole that were heretofore unknown. They were, they were masked, they were hidden. Uh, and so that's another thing that's come out of this is, is the impact on water. So one of our missions is, is outreach, to share the knowledge that's created at the university 
So we have great websites. We go to many conferences, post many articles. Are applied or submitted for awards that bring attention to it. You know, we're most proud of our award. Um, Engineering News Record is a big, yeah. big publication, and the project was selected as the project of the year for the United States in 2015. And the competition was fierce. One trades or one uh, what's it called One World Center, the new 1776. Our project was selected over that as the best of all projects. And the sustainability, the editors of the magazine came and told me, go, you know why Stanford was picked? And it's because the sustainability thing. It just wasn't that it was a phenomenal construction project or had good architecture, because it embodied something new, something that could really be shared. And so many ways this is happening. As I mentioned, we give so many tours, thousands and thousands of people from all over. They tell people. So that, you know, that word of, of mouth thing is multiplying just like it's multiplying with electric vehicles. But just like electric vehicles, there needs to be the technology capabilities, the manufacturers who can offer it. Again, I'm designing a house in Florida. And so I, I looked and, and said, look, I want something sustainable, but hurricane resilient and all that kind of thing. I'm going with insulated concrete forms and solar and stuff. But trying to find the same components at the residential scale that I have here is proven tough. And so I've gone to companies like uh, Johnson Controls, who makes home air conditioners through their York company. Uh, and they were a big partner on this. We're using a lot of their equipment and controls here. Even though we invented the system and the software and stuff, we're using some of their equipment. And so I told them, look, why don't you now move to your residential line and embody these concepts and offer these systems and software so people could do the same thing at their houses? When I looked at the data in Florida, they have a 15 to 1 ratio of of cooling load to heating load, which makes sense. It's Florida. And so looking at it across all of ours, years, the same we did here, 80% of the hot water that you would consume in a Florida residence can be made free with waste heat from the air conditioning, and nobody's taken advantage of it. <laughs> Scalable across the whole state. So think of many states, you know. As you go south by latitude, a higher and higher percentage of any heat you need can be made free with waste heat. And even in places like MIT, when uh, we actually had the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology tour the plant. And it's featured in a report to Obama. But when we were debating how to write up about the plant, um, a fellow from New York City who's big in sustainability and things up there basically said on the phone call to us, look, that's left coast Palo Alto stuff. It would never work in New York City. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> well, you know, it's because it's cold there. And so the concept of how could heat recovery work when it's cold? There's no extra heat in winter. We're freezing our butts off. We're, this ain't going to work. But you then explain it to them. It's like in summer everywhere in the United States, the lower 48, summer is called summer because it's what? It's hot, right? There's too much heat in the environment. So for a good six months of the year, there's no place in the 48 states hardly, except maybe 14,000 feet up in the mountains, that isn't have a net surplus of heat. So the last thing you need to do in Phoenix when it's 120 degrees outside is have a gas-fired hot water heater come on in your garage to make hot water for your shower. Meanwhile, your air conditioning is sending 140-degree fluid out to a fan to exhaust it into that 120-degree air. You have all the heat you need. And we prove this by models modeling MIT, by modeling the University of Illinois. Over 50% of the annual heating and hot water they need can be met just by waste heat from their existing cooling processes. And so we proved that it works in cold climates, too. And again, we thought it was scientific and, and conceptually complex, but it seems so simple now when you look at the heat charts. In summer, 100% of your heat can come from waste heat because there's too much heat. So you give it away, plus you have all you need for everything you need in the building. In winter, in ice cold climates, there's 0 to 5%. And in the shoulder seasons, it's somewhere between 0 and 100%. When you average that out, you get at least 50% everywhere, and you get into the 80s and 90s in the lower latitudes, Texas, Florida, Arizona, California. So there's this huge potential across the country to, to have 50% of the entire space heating and hot water of all of our built space could be made with heat we're throwing away. Now, what's the scale of that, and how much energy conservation, greenhouse gas, and water would it save? So trying to get policymakers, we visited the Department of Energy to show them this. So we're doing all this kind of outreach, but getting it to sink in and for them to see the strategic scale of the opportunity and then blend that into huge strategic energy plans for the country 
Well, we've gotten stalled the last few years, you know, because the administration doesn't want to hear about it, doesn't care about it. So again, it comes back to hope and inspiration. How do we inspire the next administration to take the challenge back up and realize these opportunities, not, a, not as the 13th burden of Hercules, but as a real business and economic opportunity that really will make everything better, and it won't make us all poor to do it any more than adding an airbag to our car broke the bank, right? So we can do it. I know the technology's there. You just got to have enough hope and inspiration to want to do it. You may need the capital up front, but if you can, if you can pay $1,000 a month, you can sure as heck afford to pay 900 a month, is what I say. You just need to be able to get the capital. And again, Stanford was lucky. We had debt capacity. We could borrow the money to do this. Some state institutions, universities, the state's not making the money. But it doesn't make sense for the rate payer to say, University of California, I'm not going to get you debt capacity to save money. Let's just go ahead and spend more money and be more wasteful. They've got to find a way to find the capital and make it available. And I think they can. They just got to get creative. The state government's got to understand that if I provide the capital, it will get better. Scientists, the amount of energy available on this planet is so much more than we need to live comfortably. Just the solar energy that hits the surface is you know, thousands of times more than we need to do this. We just have to you know, get over the hurdles of the last century of industrialization where certain commodities and companies and people are invested in a certain way of doing things. Their livelihood and profitability is threatened. And unfortunately, the green side of the world hasn't taken that into account and said, we've got to bring these people along. We've got to give them an exit strategy where they can stay in the game, still have their livelihoods, but help join us on this thing. Not a, we're going it and you're behind. If, you, if you're not with us, you lose. We've got to bridge that gap. So the first interesting thing is we use thermal energy storage uh, rather than a battery. And so what we're doing is very much like a battery. So imagine, you know, electricity load at a university is like a sine wave. It's highest in the day. And also our heating and cooling load is highest in the day because that's when everybody's there and things are happening. But at night, we don't have as much load. So we have about three to one ratio of day to night energy use. And so I have all these big, I have electrified now. So I have these big electric machines that can make the heating and cooling I want. Now, if I turn them on in the daytime when all that energy is needed, I'm going to add to the peak demand. So all the electricity consumed by lights and things in buildings, I'm going to add about a third more electricity to do the heating and cooling. That's the ratio. So I would go from 30 megawatts for Stanford to 40 or 50 megawatts if I did it all in the daytime. And I say, I don't want to do that because the, the grid doesn't want me to do it. It wants me to level my stuff out and take some at night and things. So I could use batteries. I could use a 10 megawatt battery and take electricity off the grid at night. And in the daytime, when I want to turn on these machines on, I could take from the battery, not take from the grid. But we do it a lot cheaper and easier. I instead run my machines at night when I'm, and use that electricity then. And I put the thermal energy in a tank, and I take it out in the day. And a big steel tank of water is a lot cheaper than a lithium ion battery of the same scale. It lasts a lot longer. It's a lot easier to maintain. And there's a number of other benefits, like I have thermal energy in storage. So if I lose my power, I have a day's worth of heat and cooling for Stanford. Uh, it reduces the amount of machines I have by allowing me to levelize things. So thermal energy storage, that's one of the other big lessons. Beside the energy water nexus, we're trying to show the state and others that all this focus on the electric microgrid of moving to batteries. Tesla would have a battery and electric car at every house, right? The heating and cooling is a much bigger opportunity, and thermal energy storage is a much bigger and cheaper alternative to electric storage for a good one-third to two-thirds of the energy supply. You may know the total energy consumed by buildings, about two-thirds is heating and cooling and one-third electricity. It's now moving to 40 to 50 percent electricity with computers and everything. But now it's going back down because of LEDs and stuff, too. But the point is, heating and cooling consumes the lion's share of energy. And so if you apply these techniques to that bigger opportunity and you use thermal storage instead of electricity, at scale, it's cheaper and lasts longer and is easier. So that's why we have such huge thermal storage tanks, because it makes sense. So uh, with that, I'd just like to say thanks for listening. There are plenty of tours. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the system or tell you how it could work at a house uh, and the different flavors of things you could do at houses. Um, and uh, hopefully after this is done being on tour, 
He will allow us to display it at Stanford somewhere. And yes. uh, I think we'll have a lot of pride to show uh, that he actually got Stanford in there. I think it's great, and I, I really appreciate that. Very good. Thank you. All right, thanks. And thank you for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. So, thank you very much. My pleasure. Wonderful. All right. Can I just say one thing? You know, he threw out a few facts and everything. It's all here. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll just show a couple of things. He talked about his hot water storage battery. There it is. He talked about his cold water storage. He talked about waste heat from the old system and waste water going down here. It's gone and money is gone. And uh, he talked about his old system having a lot of gas being burnt. And so but he is the father of Stanford's energy system. We thank him very much. And I thank for Katarina. We thank you very much for coming. Here.